uh, very much for coming to uh, tonight's seminar. Uh, it's, a, it's a subject, uh, religion and development, uh, that really interests me. I'm not going to say which institution, because otherwise people will start trying to guess who it was. But I remember a long time ago, I informed a colleague that I was going to be giving a lecture on religion and development in my modules. And the eye rolling was the least of this. I was making the cardinal <laughs> sin of bringing religion into this avowedly secular discipline. Um, and I think, you know, although there's been a huge amount of work over the past two decades, which uh, Maurice has been kind of a key part of on religion and development and wider social change, I think development studies clearly still has a religious, a religion problem. Um, I, I think it's both faith and religion blind, as well as not really, or many people not really understanding where it fits in. And what's really been really interesting is that despite that resistance, the first time I talked about it in class, there was a sense of an overwhelming release amongst the students because so many of them had come to the discipline of development studies from volunteering or from working with religious organizations or, or, or some other similar route. And it really reflected a reality for them. Uh, of course, not everyone, but I think that the fact is that we weren't talking about things that meant a huge amount to people. And of course, as we all know, uh, when we're kind of working in the various parts of the world, which is how important religion, religious discussion, religious discourse is, so it's, it's critical we uh, understand it. So I think that background makes uh, this evening's talk all the more important with the focus that we're going to have on uh, freedom of religion and belief, uh, experiences of discrimination, and thinking about innovative ways of uh, engaging with that. It, it's also... Back in the 1990s, there was a lot of work on heritage, um, and then it seemed to quiet and down again. So I, I was really interested to see, not just here, but also the amount of research proposals and, and new ideas and innovation focused on heritage over the past maybe four or five years. Um, it makes it a really interesting lens, I think, through which to pursue what we'll be thinking about this evening. And I'm really pleased to have two wonderful speakers. Firstly, uh, Professor Marie Tadros, who... We've, I've known her work for a, a long time, but we've never actually met. So this is a, a really nice opportunity to meet for the first time. And mm -hmm. is Professor of Politics and Development at IDS at Suffolk, uh, former director of the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development, current director of the Middle East People's Culture Conservation Collective, author of many things. I'll just pick out three books, uh, or the, her three books on gender, Islamism and Cops in Egypt, amongst many of her other publications. Have a look uh, at um, the list. There's some uh, amazing and amazingly interesting things there. Uh, also delighted that Romina uh, Estrati, who I think has now joined us, we had some technical issues, um, uh, is joining us tonight. Uh, she's a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow in the School of History, Religions and Philosophies here at SOAS. She's the co-chair of the SOAS Centre for World Christianity, co-founder and editor of Decolonial Subversions. And she's a principal investigator on a project which is looking at religion, de gender, development, public health and domestic violence, which builds on work that was done for her brilliant PhD thesis. I know it was brilliant because I was one of the examiners, <laughs> so it's, I'm delighted to be able to chair. Oh, there we go. I chair this session. Uh, hi, Romina. Um, so, uh, Marita is going to speak for about 30 minutes. Then we'll Good hand... to be with you. Thank you. Then we'll uh, hand over uh, to Romina and then we'll open up for Q&A and we'll finish around 6.30. Marita, please. Thank you. Um, I think I'd like to start by thanking uh, the Department of International Development and Professor Nguyen Singh who invited me. Thank you very, very much for giving me this amazing learning opportunity. And thank you to Professor Jennings and Dr. Strati for... Um, helping to anchor this, and I look forward to learning from you too, and from everyone here, and as well as any, everyone online. Um, and um, I know exactly what you mean when you said that sense of awkwardness, and I probably shouldn't be sharing this anecdote, and I didn't, I did not prepare, I was not thinking of starting with this anecdote, um, so, um, but I will share it. I think the first time I uh, shared with colleagues in IDS, that we are, we've established a consortium comprised of faith and non-faith based human rights and academic and pra development practitioner um, organizations and initiatives. And we are going to be looking at freedom of religion or belief in development. And I am, I belong in the Institute of Development Studies to a, a very particularly open inclusive uh, uh, cluster of research. 
And the initial reaction was complete silence. <laughs> it was just silence. And I was thinking, how do I break this silence? What do I do? What do I say? And, you know, and at IDS, if you ever go visit, we don't have moments of silence. Everybody has everything to say at all times. And then uh, a dear colleague of ours, uh, um, Meritai Professor Rosalind Ivan, uh, sort of looked up and said, hmm, this looks very much deja vu. I remember 50 years ago when I talked about women in development at DFID, the international development um, part of uh, the UK government. We don't have it anymore, but at that time it did exist. I remember getting that silence as well. And I think that sense of comparison of 50 years ago when people dared talk about issues of women's rights and women's inequality in development and that sense of comparison with how does it... How does it relate to raising issues of freedom of religion or belief is quite interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are coming from, who's we, and then I'll, I'll, I'll touch on three points. I'll touch on the case for freedom of religion or belief and how it's a little bit different to the overall, the broader paradigm of religion and development, because there's been an enormous amount of very important work uh, by Professor Jennings, by Dr. Estrati, by um, also uh, Dr. Naomi's work, uh, Professor Naomi's work on um, uh, the three uh, financial fuel and food crises touched on the role of uh, faith-based organizations, as well as colleagues here, and I'm sure your own work. So there's been a lot happening on religion and development. I want to talk a bit about the inequalities dimension, and then I'll move on to why is it that development can't, why is it that development struggles with freedom of religion or development as an inequality issue? And I will end on talking about heritage. How FOB and heritage, freedom of religion or belief, which I'll refer to as FOB, linked to heritage? Well, you'll just have to bear with me for the next 20 minutes, um, for which I'll come to. But, um, I will also be doing, I confess, some um, self ashamed promotion of some of our publications, which are all open access. So you can, I don't mind just uh, checking them out while we're talking. It's absolutely fine. I will not need psychotherapy if you look to your, um, if you look to your computer uh, screens and and, uh, and check them out. So I will be putting them on screen as I talk because um, it's uh, it's all there, uh, very accessible. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the wee bit. So in round about 2019, um, a group of consortium members, some of which included a Muslim faith-based organization based in London, but with um, a good outreach or presence in uh, many parts of the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and Hawaii, um, as well as Rifsemi, which is um, coming from an indigenous Christian Middle Eastern background. In other words, it's not the conventional um, uh, Christian faith-based actor that you engage with, because it comes from the Coptic uh, church, which was a church that has its own Christian trajectory that dates back to 48 AD, when Christianity became very syncretically engaged with the ancient Egyptian forms of, of worship, and then it took on its own orthodox path. And Minority Rights Group, which works on ethnic, religious, sexual minorities, um, and as well as others, and with IDS as an academic anchor. And then we had about 30 to 40 partners across the world. Um, and if I'll, I can share this with you later, but if we, we purposely, after getting necessary permissions, um, if you look at our the, the map of where we worked, we um, we work in quite a lot of countries that are very varied in um, the positioning of religion, the positioning of minorities, the nature of different forms of marginalization. Um, we, the work we did was very much based on the idea of um, inductive theorization. We wanted to understand if people who are committed to redressing inequalities and poverty wanted or to engage with the issues of people who are marginalized because of the intersection of religion and other factors and wanted to bring that into the equation of advancing positive change independently of what that looked like in their setting, what would that mean? And it was a very difficult 
conversation because of two things. The majority of countries where we worked um, were ones where um, we didn't use the word freedom of religion or belief at all. Um, it was just ironic. We were seeking to understand how to bring about an inclusive change that took into account people who are marginalized on the basis of their faith or their belief system. And yet we found the term freedom of religion or belief deeply problematic. So we had to come up with all kinds of different ways of talking about that marginalization. Uh, we'll come back to that towards the end of our engagement. Um, so what we sought out to understand was people who are committed to, oh, sorry, yes, something's happened. Thank you. Thank you. It's not moving. I'm sorry. It's my magic touch. Um, people who are committed to inclusive lens of advancing poverty alleviation, social change, and so forth. How do they think about religious marginalization? And of course, it meant that in many cases, whenever we looked at the major development players, the World Bank, the, I the UN agencies, including the ILO and UN Women, and all these agencies, there was a blank. I'm generalizing very badly. Yes, there were exceptions, but I'm talking about trends as opposed to case studies. The same thing with um, international development organizations in these countries. Uh, they really struggled with it. But before I, I talk about what we were doing, I just want to very quickly um, talk about, we started with this and then we transgressed dramatically. I don't think it's moving. I think it's my magic touch again. <laughs> It's the arrows that I'm using. Maybe I should just double click on it. Maybe that would work. No, it's still my magic touch. Right. So initially, and I'm saying initially because uh, we were funded by the UK government. So the UK government expects you to come up with a theory of change. How are you going to change the world through your assumptions about how change is going to happen? So we came up with this idea that we would try and um, transform how international development is, uh, the architecture of international development by bringing in religious inequalities. We would look at how to bring people across different faiths and value systems together um, to uh, advance um, assistance programs in ways that, uh, you know, get them to work together. Um, we would engage with the relationship between online hate speech and how that leads to the mobilization of hate on the ground and vice versa. And we would try and bring coalitions of people who come from very different backgrounds but are committed to an inclusive vision um, together. And we would try and be as, um, as interconnected in the rights we bring together as possible. Disability with freedom of religion or belief, gender with climate change, and so forth. And so we wanted to de-ghettoize the idea that you'd have to be a person of faith, or you'd have to have a value system pertaining to something that is sacred in order for you to care about those who uh, are marginalized on the basis of faith. It's a bit like the argument that we were making in women in development 50 years ago, that it's not a woman's issue. It is an issue to do with our visions of humanity, of civilization, of, of the order of society, of politics, and so forth. So we wanted to also take that and say, you don't have to be someone who is practicing a faith to care about inclusion and marginalization. Now, a lot of this, of course, as you expect, was dramatically challenged when we started, our starting point was not to issue calls for applications or proposals. Who wants to work on this? That was not how we started. The way we started was, where do we have partners that have legitimacy on the ground? Now, legitimacy is not a word you often associate with international development um, policies and practices. I don't think when you come to apply for a position in development, they say, so have you thought about your legitimacy or the legitimacy? It's not something that's part of our regular lexicon. But for us, that was key because Legitimacy is extremely important um, for 
um, having relations based on mutual respect and recognition and recognizing our own extraordinary limitations. So we started with the idea of where do we have partners um, that care about this issue, that have legitimacy on the ground in the communities um, and with various stakeholders that are important and also legitimacy uh, so that we don't create uh, unintended outcomes of people disappearing or ending up in prison because of their association with us, which again, we don't often get to think about the unintended outcomes of the potential harm we bring, even with uh, wanting to carry uh, something that is positive and inclusive. So uh, with our partners, we were able to within four years, and I hate to use numbers, but um, I, I think I will because it was, I just wanted to sort of talk about scale. Within four years, working primarily initially in Iraq, Pakistan, Myanmar, Egypt, um, and Nigeria, and then we also had a wide area of other countries uh, that are on this map, South Africa, Uganda, and so forth. We were able to engage directly with 92,504 persons and indirectly with over 2 million. The reason why this, this number is so big is because a lot of it was through online engagement, um, not through. Um, but the reason why I'm putting these numbers on the board, because a lot of our initiatives were not research, they were aspects of um, engaging with basic priorities on the ground for communities on the margin for us to understand how do you not create an unintended backlash when you engage with something because the literature on this particular aspect was very limited. Why is it limited? Because a lot of the work on freedom of religion belief tended to be very high up uh, advanced by foreign policy actors who do not work on the grassroots. They engage with counter diplomats and so forth. So um, it was through very much engaging, and I know there is a massive problem, as you all know, with the concept of community. Um, but uh, I'll come back to it in, in a minute with uh, those on the ground. Now, um, what does freedom of religion or belief mean? Um, it basically, uh, for all of us, I think, all of us who work on freedom of religion belief, we start with Article 18 of the UN Universal Declaration um, uh, of Rights, which is that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And this right includes freedom to change his or her religion or belief, um, and freedom either alone or in community with others um, to, to express that publicly or privately. Now, why is this an important issue? Um, well, the Pew survey, and I know everybody knows there are limitations with Pew research in terms of methodology, but it's the best we have for global uh, numbers, uh, says that um, we see encroachments on freedom of religion or belief in 190 out of 198 countries that they surveyed, and it was higher than 2023. And this is not just the Pew. So if anybody has a problem with the Pew research methodologies, I hear you. But if we talk about corroboration, we if we look at other work, the work of Jonathan Fox and Hertzke and others, there has been a decline in freedom of religion globally as a trend. So we're not talking here about from one year to another, but as a general trend as we move into the 21st century. And of course, this is a very interesting figure I got from one of the UN reports that globally, one in six persons experiences discrimination based on racial, ethnic, religious, or other grounds. They haven't desegregated this to us um, in terms of what is religious, what is ethnic, but I think it's really good that they didn't actually, because a lot of the inequalities are intersecting. Um, and we'll come back to this in a minute. Now, I'm, I'm going to go straight into some definitional issues before I move back to in development, because I just want to highlight, again, we've, we have, we had a paradigmatic shift in development thinking at some point, around about the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when there was very important scholarship being released, and of course, Professor Jennings and others also contributed to that, to talk about the fact that all the meta theories of development, whether it's modernization, whether it's dependency theory, or or whatever, you know, whatever theory you choose, that they had a certain assumption about what will happen to people's identities as 
uh, they so-called progress forwards. And basically, um, a lot of it was based on the assumption that religion will faint into disappearance um, as we move forward. And of course, it hasn't. It hasn't in the Western world as it hasn't in the global south. So that was the religion development work that then said to them, well, let's pay attention to religious actors, religious agency, the role of religion in people's lives, whether positively or negatively. It was mostly a literature that talked about recognition, bless you. Um, you know, recognizing religion there, just not, you know, not ignoring it as the mammoth in the room, not even elephant in the room. Um, freedom of religion or belief is a little bit different because yes, it, it wants to recognize the importance of religion in influencing power configurations, but um, it focuses a lot more on the inequalities of people on the ground. So here with the religion and development, a lot of it was about recognizing actors, doctrines, and role in development services. Here we're talking about inequalities. We're talking about when you are, when you have a differential access to education, to health, um, to um, uh, welfare benefits, um, uh, to even just how you are treated in the market. Because one aspect of your identity happens to be something that those that are engaging with you don't like. Now, it could be that they're discriminating against you, not just because of your religion, but because you are, because of your religion and your ethnicity or your religion and your race or your religion and gender, all of these. But there is an aspect there where the targeting, if you like, part of it is because of your association with a religion or a belief system independently of whether you are practicing it or not. In other words, you could be, you know, someone that is associated with a particular faith, but you've never gone to that place of worship, or you rarely go, but just by being associated is enough to make you vulnerable to targeting. And that was for us this idea of how do we bring that into the conversations on inequalities. Now, a lot of the religion and development work, um, which is just formidable, and this is all of this is very reductionist. In other words, I'm making here some extremely problematic summary of a lot more nuanced arguments for the sake of time. Um, but a lot of it was to do with the idea that if we bring on board faith identities and the role of faith leaders, this can help to address some of the exclusions associated with faith leaders being um, excluded from political settlements, excluded from discussions about uh, new constitutions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that is true because they have been often excluded depending on the context. Again, depending on the context, sometimes, as we know, in certain countries, they're overrepresented. Um, here, we were talking about othering, targeting, vulnerability because of what you are associated with. But I think probably the most important thing is. When we're talking about how change happens or the, the, under, the underpinning assumptions about change was in religion and development, we were talking about more of faith. Here, we were talking about possibly sometimes more of faith, but sometimes not necessarily so. Because whereas the faith and development talked about recognition of faith very broadly, perhaps more narrowly or more widely, depends on how you look at it, it depends on the context. This was talking about people and not religions. In other words, we were trying to talk about freedom of religion or belief for individuals, for communities. It was not about more of religion X in the public sphere, more of religion Y. And it's very interesting because when we come to talk about hate speech, you know, the, the, then the discussions become very, very prickly because you know, people would come and nudge and say, oh, this work on freedom of original belief, do you think you can promote my faith system on your website? Because we have, we're very peace loving and we're this and that. And it's like, well, you know, I'm sure you are, but we're not in the business of promoting religions. We're in the business of identifying where inequalities exist, intersecting inequalities and understanding why is it that these inequalities have been overlooked? 
What is it about our societies, our politics, our ways of seeing the world that find it completely acceptable and legitimate to exclude those from, uh, from, uh, from, from just, just from their, um, from any analysis of power relations, really. Um, so uh, the second issue is that, of course, we're not just talking about religion as in doctrines. We're talking also about belief systems. And that's where the or belief becomes very important, because indigenous people do not have what you would call a traditional dogma or set of beliefs, but they do have beliefs that they hold as sacrosanct, as sacred. And that was very important to bring into the conversation about inequalities and exclusions of people, a fundamental aspect of people's, not just agency, but how they see themselves in the world and what they see as, as, as their role in the world. So it was really important for us that we also recognize um, the belief system of indigenous people, um, and the fact that in many parts of the world, there is a mixing and matching of your belief system. It is not just, I started with the idea of the Coptic church in Egypt, starting with a syncretic dynamic relationship between the, the, the Christian faith and the ancient Egyptian ways of worship and how those came together. But if we look at India, uh, and we have some amazing examples in this book, which is open access, and I'll leave it here on the board for you. Uh, amazing examples of how um, a, a Hindu woman would uh, pray to Saint Anthony when her son gets sick, but she would go to the to the temple because of a very uh, uh, because of a very important uh, um, celebration happening there, and she has a goddess which the Hindutva, the the those that are currently defining what constitutes a Hindu identity, find that this goddess is superior to their god gods and goddesses that they won't recognize. But she has, she has, she has a, a statue of the goddess in her room. At the same time, she will join her Muslim neighbor when her Muslim neighbor goes to a Sufi shrine. So that kind of syncretism becomes very important in recognizing that when, if, this, if you ask this woman, are you a Hindu, a Christian, or Muslim? Uh, based on where you worship or what you do, it becomes very problematic because yes, she's a Hindu, but it's not that she's a Hindu, meaning that she doesn't recognize and engage with directly other belief systems that she takes on as her own. So that was very important for us to also understand the dynamics of inequalities that go beyond um, the size. Now, nonists, of course, because we know that in some parts of the world, your identity card does not allow you to say I have no religion. It doesn't exist. It, 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 you cannot say I am an atheist. You, you just can't. It's, it's, not, it's not a possibility. And I think although we didn't in practice, to be very honest, deal with um, collectives of communities who said, will you work with us because we want to have that option on our ID card, it, it was, I think, the bit about freedom of religion or belief, the belief system bit was very important to recognize that it's not just about um, those that have faith, but it's those that were the, the, the fundamental belief system clashes with religious homogenization trends. By religious homogenization trends, I mean um, the concentration of power in the hands of those that are able to shape politics and societies in ways that determine a certain way of uh, living and believing and professing what constitutes that system. So we're talking here about cases where um, um, even if, just go, to back, go back to the example, we have, even if you are a practicing Hindu, but you're not, you're not sticking to what constitutes the attempt by the Hindutva to determine that. Or if we're talking here about Nigeria, where um, if you are a Muslim um, uh, woman in, in northern Nigeria and you are practicing Islam in ways that have very strong populist dimensions that are syncretized with traditional religions in Nigeria, but you do not conform to some particular uh, aspirations of um, uh, of those that are in power of what constitutes Islam, you are in trouble. Um, 
And so I, we were talking about what does it mean when we live in contexts where there is an attempt at homogenizing, oh no, really? Uh, um, and what would that look like? Now, I want to talk about a little bit, just go to the, the bit about can we address this in international development? Can we bring in those intersections of inequalities based on class, ethnicity, gender, um, um, as they are experienced by people who are marginalized because uh, they belong or they practice a certain faith or belief system into international development? Well, I'm going to talk about four key issues. Um, the, oh, I think I've done a mistake again. Sorry, I have to, yeah. I think I've just wasted 10 minutes there, Mike. <laughs> so I'm going to very briefly talk about three things. Yes, we do have an ontological, epistemological, and methodological dilemma when we engage with freedom of religion development. Freedom of ritual development, whether we're talking about a lot of the belief systems of indigenous people or a lot of the faiths, don't see the temporal parameters in the same way that secular development sees it. Life doesn't start and end with your 60 years or your 90 years. There's, there's a different knowledge of what life is. And uh, for Abrahamic faiths, there's the idea of transcending into an afterlife. Uh, as well as for other religions and for indigenous peoples, there's a sense of a, a, an interface between who you are and nature, flora and fauna, and a wide array of very complex belief systems about agency isn't just the personhood, but person within its interface with part of a broader system. So there's the temporal aspect, there is the porousness of who you are in relation to others, but there's also a wide array of issues of uh, transcendent as in what you don't see and touch and feel, um, which is seen as absolutely essential for your well-being. Now, if you remember, Maslow had the pyramid, and in his pyramid where you start with your basic needs and you move up and, you know, uh, he'd probably see this idea of the transcendent dimensions as a privilege, as something, you know, if, if you can afford to have those kind of belief systems after your... But actually, I think now there's a lot of scholarship that is emerging that's saying, no, I mean, people's sense of the spiritual aspects of who they are can sometimes even supersede uh, some of their basic uh, needs of, um, uh, of uh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't just start with food and drink, but I would say uh, aspects of what other people would say are crucial bundles in our HDR, Human Development Index. So... I think, yes, there is a problem ontologically and um, epistemologically in terms of how do we then un engage with people's full being in a way that recognizes those aspects? How do you capture that in a human development index? But then there are also issues, which is where the fundamental work of the religion and development par paradigm shifters, if you like, exposed is issues of positionality and standpoint is that we, for those that have come uh, from a sense of extreme distrust of religion because they see it as the cause behind all horrors on earth, there is the sense of, am I advancing a regressive agenda by advancing freedom of religious belief? Am I allowing a space for more of the bad stuff? And I think they don't actually articulate it. But then sometimes even just personal biases associated with, with negative experiences. If you happen to be in a, in a school that had a particular faith identity and you had a mean teacher and that mean teacher wanted to appear as if they are the representation of that religion, well, that affects you. It affects how you then engage with those aspects. And the idea of being upfront about our, our biases, our prejudices, uh, where we stand on issues, um, is, is, is problematic because people don't, you know, they try and legitimize biases and prejudices by saying, well, actually, it's not religion, it's ethnicity. Well, actually, it's not religious inequality, it's based on gender. There's a continuous trend in international development to try and say it's ethnicity, 
its religion, its ethnicity, class, uh, political ideology, gender. And yes, if we talk about intersections, it could be all of these things. But sometimes there's also a dimension to do with religious ideology. And we have to reckon with them, positively as well as negatively. It's not a normative stance. It's about just incorporating it into our power dynamics. Sometimes it will be very positive in terms of what people find as uh, advancing their well-being. Sometimes it encroaches on spaces, but it just needs to be reckoned with. Um, the other thing is, of course, and I'm going to start rushing. Um, is the issue of um, policy framings and, and, and frameworks. If you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, we had a, a book called Poverty and Prejudice um, out, which looked at every, almost every single SDG and how it overlooked those intersections we're looking at. And it's really interesting because uh, one of our colleagues looked at who tends to be disproportionately in prison? And surprise, surprise, the Dalits, the Adivasis, and the Muslims. Just in looking at, these are the profiles of people who tended to be disproportionately represented in prison in India. But then we also know that in other contexts, it's the opposite. If we look in Pakistan, the Hindus are persecuted just across the border. And there, if you happen to be a Hindu Dalit and you happen to live in the Sindh province, you are going to be talking and you are going to be likely a part of the bonded labor uh, uh, for parts of the uh, Sindh province. So we looked at this and it's interesting because for every single SDG, we had evidence that the intersection of religion and ethnicity, depending on which part of the world you look, is relevant, but yet completely ignored, completely ignored. Religious discrimination was mentioned once as part of the indicator, not even as, as, as something key. One of the indicators, in uh, uh, SDG 10, 10.3, I believe. I'm going to start really rushing now. Um, <laughs> so, um, if I can get to, yeah, sorry. Now, what does it mean in practice? Um, so I began with talking about the difficulties of using the term freedom of religion or belief um, in the context in which we worked. Um, the, the term is very problematic because sometimes it's associated with a Western construct that has historically been used in some context to divide and conquer. Um, in some places, we know that it has been weaponized as part of foreign policy to, uh, to vilify certain countries and ignore others who have massive fault violations. So this idea of double standards and how it's been used has been problematic. We've found different ways of talking about um, belonging and community and um, relationships and so forth. I think one of the things that we found quite interesting um, is the concept of heritage. And heritage here, I know for a lot of people is, you think of manuscripts and museums and um, preservation of important objects. And it's all of these, but it's also something else. And part of the decolonization of heritage that is happening at the moment or has started happening for a while is the idea of starting with the people on the ground who actually uh, practice different ways of valuing heritage. And heritage here, we talk about basically what people pass on to the future generations consciously and unconsciously. This may sound very, very problematic because it's well, we pass on so many things. But in essence, if we are really going to talk about the pluralization of knowledge, of what counts for people, then we have to start with the conversations about what do you find as important? If you were passing something on to your children or your nieces or your, you know, what would you think? What are the value systems? What are the ideas? What are the things that happen in your life that you want them to know about and you want them to maintain? And that was very important because this is where you see the divergence between what development priorities can sometimes be, and I won't generalize, sometimes be, and what people say is really important for them. And that became an eye-opener because it just released the opportunity to have those conversations that allow us to engage with freedom of religion or belief in ways that are, transcend what we think of as well-being. Um, I really am going to end, I promise. <laughs> I'm just going to give an individual example and a collective example. So um, this is Nemsho Shlosmo. She is a Yazidi from northern Iraq, and she was interviewed by her granddaughter, um, uh, Nida Khalil Asra. And it, we could 
can you imagine if you are telling young people, can you go ask your grandmother about the genocide? Can you imagine? But instead, the starting point of the conversation were these. Can you see these dots, these green dots? Now, these are not the conventional tattoos that you get in a parlor here. This is an ancient practice that exists in many cultures, not just in the Middle East, not just in Iraq, but across the world. It's a way of marking who you are on your body in different ways. This is you, uh, the technique is fascinating. I don't think we have time to go through the technique. But the point is, when we engage with young people in Northern Iraq who were Yazidi, talking about the preservation of their heritage, we said to them, go out and tell us what's important, the Yazidi people. Not, you know, yes, we had the conversation about educating healthcare, but that wasn't the starting point. She started with having a conversation with her grandmother. Why did you have those dots? Why was it important for you to share with me those dots? Why did you want me to have those dots? What, what do they tell you? And through those conversations about those tattoos, we got a sense of everything to do with the historic, her narrative of the Yazidi history, her narrative of vulnerabilities, strengths, celebrations, mornings, because then she started to talk about the day in which she had, uh, who did she bring along? Who did she have those done with? What did it mean to her? Who wh was her grandmother also? To, why was it important? What kind of life was her grandmother living? It's, I mean, and this is in, in some way, part of it is actually not new to international development, which is the power of storytelling. It, that's, this has been part of the contributions of humanities to social sciences, understandings of development for a long time. The difference is, I think, is that here we're telling people, what is it that you pass on to the next generations as our starting point for getting people to define the parameters of what stories to tell? Um, I'm going to move from the individual because a lot of our conversations about tattoos is how we got insights into aspects of persecution that go decades back, decades and decades and decades back. Um, but I want to move if I can manage to do this, and I promise this really is coming to an end, is this. The collective power of heritage to understand issues of intersecting inequalities. I'm sorry, this looks so horrible. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go back to this. Now, <laughs> this is an image um, of uh, a man drumming, and it is um, in this book, which is also open access, and it comes from Philip Mader's chapter um, on engaging a particular program in the Adivasis, where the Adivasis are an indigenous people in India who um, are over 10 million and have their own system, belief system, and um, are in clashes with the government because of rights to land, but also because the way they express their uh, belief in what is sacred clashes with some of the Hindu ideologies propagation of a system that excludes aspects of indigenous belief systems. Interestingly, um, they found that talking and engaging through heritage, I don't, you don't have to read it, but it, it, heritage provided them with a number of things that allowed them to engage in an authoritarian, this is um, in an authoritarian, well, no, let me rephrase this. Heritage allowed them to engage um, on who they are in ways that were, that allowed them to gain more sympathy among local officials than if their framework was, we have an international human rights law which protects our rights and rights, let's get on with implementing this law. It, the way in which they engaged through dancing, through uh, food, through festivals, uh, and invited the local officials as key guests to partake of those festivals allowed difficult conversations to happen that would not conventionally happen if you were in a more confrontational setup. This is in no way to say that heritage should substitute for demanding rights, absolutely not. But it is to say that for people who live in contexts where political spaces 
are deeply circumscribed, sometimes we need to find ways of innovatively advancing rights and making claims that allow us some ground where other more confrontational tactics will be counterproductive to um, securing the well-being of the community. I'm not saying it as a generalization. I'm just saying in some contexts, in some parts, heritage becomes a way of sharing food, um, sharing festivals, sharing songs, dance, that allows a slightly more relaxed way. Of course, that is not always the case. You know, Try doing this in Afghanistan today and good luck to you. you know, no amount of heritage conversations will allow you to um, uh, have a local Taliban come and join in. That would be seen as blasphemous. So again, this is not to generalize, but I'm saying that this was very important for us because this was outside the remit of what we had conceived as engaging with issues of inequalities when we first started. So this is why I was talking about transcendence of invisible divides. The transcendence of a divide between seeing development as just temporal and seeing development as how people see their their, 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 their being, the transcendence of, um, 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 of, of, of everything that has to do with um, the relationship between your personal agency and a broader system, the transcendence of this idea of there are first these rights and then these rights, it, doesn't, it, it needs to be released from that kind of straitjacketing. Um, but I, I actually, and it, it's not, it's not without its problems, of course, because I am um, biased towards trying to, um, uh, to, to sort of make the case for taking into consideration those intersecting inequalities. I haven't had a chance to talk about the critique of this, but I'm just putting them as some of the questions for perhaps discussion later on. Thank you for being extremely gracious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not so. I'm sure we'll come to it, but we'll go. We'll go straight to Ramina first. So we, we've got about, about ten minutes, please. Um, we'll just let you get set up. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Lovely. Um. So thank you so much for having me. Um. I, I should say this is an interesting reunion. Uh, my, Michael, you might not know. Um, Marise was actually the examiner of my master's thesis at IDS when I did my gender and development. And I remember I was so relieved when I found Marise because nobody understood what I was talking about in my cluster. Uh, if I mentioned anything around religious belief, it was uh, there was silence. I mean, the, t the type that Maurice talked about. So, uh, so Maurice um, examined my master's thesis uh, very generous, generously and and open mindedly, as I needed at the time. And then um, Mike examined my my PhD thesis. So it's a it's an interesting coming together here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, just to confirm again that you can hear me because I have a little bit of delay on my end, and I want to make sure that you can hear me. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Lovely. Okay. Um, Maurice, thank you so much for the presentation. It's been about 10 years, honestly, um, that I last uh, engaged deeply with uh, with the, the work you do. And it's it's amazing to see how far this has has, has come. Um, I, I have a few thoughts. I mean, honestly, the, the, the thoughts I have are mostly um, reaffirmations of what you said. Um, it's 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 really important work. I think this distinction between religion and development, or how religion is being engaged within development practice, theory and practice, versus the conversation around religious belief, is an important distinction to be made. Uh, and I admittedly, when I entered um, in this conversation, and I will say a little bit about my background in a minute, I did not make that distinction. Um, perhaps because the way I approached it, I approached religion was from a sort of decolonial angle as seeing it as religious worldview, as systems of belief, the, in the type that you are talking about, Maurice. Um, and my argument has been that development should engage with religious systems and religious worldviews more holistically. Um, and so by default, if we do that, I think we then get to the questions of 
religious beliefs, beliefs, uh, especially in multi-religious context, but also, you know, in, in highly polarized uh, or divisive societies as well, such as the ones I work in. Um, so, so I, I think it's there, there's a lot of value in making that distinction, and and I don't think that we have engaged with that distinction systematically enough. Uh, certainly, I have not seen that conversation being had within religion and development as we understand the field of studies. Um, the, I, I, it is interesting because I so just uh, as a summary quickly for the audience, um, I've been working on desecularizing international development responses to uh, gender inequalities and gender-based violence uh, within low and middle income countries, especially uh, in the African region. And again, I came to this work because I saw a lot of ethical, epistemological, and practical tensions between a very secularist, ethnocentric language around what constitutes gender inequality or gender equality uh, versus what the gender worldviews of the communities I worked with uh, understood as gender equality um, or standard or normative gender relations. So there was the there was there were the, I saw certain tensions. Apologies, um, and many of these tensions emerged from actual incommensurability of belief. So there was a, a very kind of modernity based secularist understanding of the world versus. Uh, an understanding that was very contextual and community specific, which was oftentimes informed by the people's religious worldviews. And again, um, it, it's not just a worldview, it's it's people's lived identities. It's embodied, uh, it's not simply doctrine, it's not simply teaching, it's not simply um, uh, theory or notions or concepts, but it's embodied practice, uh, which are intertwined. And so I saw these tensions very quickly um, and, and I have been working, in fact, um, I mean, the motivation behind my work is to find bridges um, and, 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 and really promote a decolonization of sorts within international development paradigms um, that, again, try to understand people's lived religious experiences in the ways they embody them, as opposed to how they're theorized within modernity uh, and, and the epistemology that dominates within the disciplines. Um, and recently, I've actually been advising the, um, I've done a bit, a, a bit of work with the Office of um, Security and Cooperation um, in Europe, uh, the, the Division of Human Rights. And they are actually looking exactly at the tensions between freedom of religion. I was really interested that, that they actually do that. Because uh, as you said, Maurice, this is the big elephant in the room. Nobody really likes to address these tensions. They're too difficult to bridge. Um, so they're actually looking at the tensions between freedom of religion uh, and conscience versus gender equality and sort of understanding, again, recognizing that sometimes these different rights are at conflict with each other. It's exactly what you were saying, Marie. And I, and I, 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 I'm, I think it's, it's, real, it's encouraging that we're actually having these conversations. Um, you know, oftentimes the way religion... Uh, um, Faith-informed individuals, because, because again, as you say, freedom of religion is not freedom of the rights of individuals, not of religious traditions, right? right? This is an important understanding uh, of, of the concept uh, that we have in the International Human Rights Convention. Um, so, it, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's interesting to me that this conversation is now coming more, is becoming more and more salient. Uh, there is more acknowledgement that there are actually, you know, we, there are tensions, as you said, Maurice, between different types of rights that are being promoted within international development and international conventions and discourse. But we haven't really looked at those uh, intersecting identities, uh, you know, contextually enough to understand what these tensions are. So it's, it, it, I see a parallel there. Um, and, and and again, I think that your work would probably would be very useful and valuable to inform those type of conversations, those types of conversations as well. Um, and I'm also not surprised that the word heritage, uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, very clear on whether the word heritage is, is something that is being pushed as a framing to promote these types of conversations um, and understandings, or is something that actually communities bring up as a term? 
because in my research, uh, long-term anthropological research uh, on the experience of faith in domestic violence in Ethiopia, oftentimes when people spoke about their faith or religious tradition, they would oftentimes use the word heritage. And again, because for them, heritage is very much in, um, intertwined with the idea of identity, who we are and, and what we bring forward from the previous generations and what we maintain and, and, and um, preserve. And that preservation of religious tradition, right, oftentimes, even though it may not be actual theological teaching, it might just be um, really, uh, it, might, it might be a sort of a, a, uh, a cultural norm that is framed in religious terms that people consider part of their religious tradition. Um, and, and they may know that it's not actual teaching, but they still will be very um, hesitant to, to deviate from it because deviating from it means giving up on that heritage and who you are. So it's it's these types of intricacies that I think you you really touch very well on. I, I have to say, um, and and I think that international development needs to reckon with that we 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 don't really reckon with. I think even today. Um, so in the past four years, I have been leading a project that works to streamline faith sensitive perspectives and culturally adapted perspectives to how we analyze and theorize and respond to domestic violence in East Africa and ethnic minority communities in the UK. Um, and even we do work with religious leaders, uh, as you pointed out, Marie, this is the current approach within religion and development. Um, but we want to also move away from this instrumentalist understanding of religion, that it is something to be used or deployed to respond to international or societal uh, challenges um, and really engage with religious leaders and stakeholders and mediators as part of a larger cultural system, societal system, where they can become, you know, when, when it comes to domestic violence, for instance, that I engage with, they can inform the problem, but they can also inform the solution because it really depends on how these resources are deployed, right? And how they're engaged. Um, I really also liked the interfaith uh, component that you had, and I'm guessing you're very much informed by also the Egyptian context. So recently, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Ali Afifi and myself did a bit of research um, on interfaith engagement of Muslim and Christian clerics in responding to domestic violence in Egypt and Ethiopia. Um, and, 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 you know, when, when one starts to think about interfaith engagement, to respond to societal issues of whatever nature, um, one has to reckon with this question of religious belief again, because how do you bring different clerics from different religious traditions who may uh, follow very different, uh, have very different understandings, but follow very different like, exegetical traditions as well, um, into, into a space, a common space, uh, where we can sort of reach a, an agreement about the issue at hand and how to respond to it. Um, and and may, may both of these contexts, Ethiopia and Egypt, um, especially Ethiopia that I know of, so better off, so I'm going to refer to Ethiopia here, um, ascribe, you know, uh, promote inclusivity and diversity. So when you engage with a religious community, you should not discriminate, you should engage, should engage all religious communities within a program of development. Um, so that, so, so you have to be inclusive. Um, part of understanding religious belief means to engage with religious plurality. That's what I'm trying to say. And, and that, that in itself is, doesn't happen easily. And I don't think that we have given any attention on that, you know, on engaging with religious plur plurality in societies that are, are multi-religious and may actually experience also polarizations are, are along ethno-religious lines. And again, Religious identity is oftentimes deployed in political antagonism is not necessarily the origin of the issue. And um, so I'm I'm just very impressed. I think uh, overall, uh, I don't want to speak for longer, but I, I think you touched on, on all sorts of themes that we are we have been dealing with in the recent years. Um, and I really think there needs to be more conversation of what religious belief constitutes. So as a as a direction forward. And um, because um, I've written previously, when when we think of how the of how these conventions 
uh, talk about religious belief and conscience, they have a very humanistic understanding whereby they assume a division between conscience and practice. Uh, and, and that's what the convention does too, right? It says that it's on the one hand, freedom of religion is to have freedom of conscience to choose your belief or to reject a belief. And then on the other hand, it's also to be able to practice those beliefs and you know whatever these are. But that division doesn't exist in other in non-Western worldviews necessarily. The, the conscience and the practice are intertwined and interdependent. And I'm giving the example of the Ethiopian Orthodox Sahara Church that I work with. Um, when you talk about theology, theology is the product of embodied praxis of sainthood. So a, 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 the theologian, it, the doctor of the faith, that is to say, is the saint who has practiced the faith in everyday life. And that distinction, therefore, between conscience and practice, again, is, is not applicable. And I think when we, I think in the future, we really need to have a conversation about the definition and the assumptions that these definitions of religious belief and conscience make in international conventions, because these international conventions are then uh, introduced and streamlined across the world, right? But they don't consider necessarily that diversity of definition and, and, and understanding of uh, embodied conscience, let's put it that way, and how people, how people understand human conscience, essentially, right? And again, <laughs> when I work with gender, I start with concepts of humanity. We have different concepts of humanity. Um, so if we have different concepts of humanity, we have different concepts of conscience and the relationship with the physical world. That's where we, I really think we need a, uh, to deconstruct more of these, uh, deconstruct more of these concepts um, and, and, and apply a modernity coloniality lens. Uh, I, one cannot talk about these issues without being informed by decolonial theory, in my understanding and, and opinion. We do have to understand that this, this system we exist in, as you explained, Maurice, is very much has been defined by certain experiences that Western societies have, have had with the category of religion, which is a 19th century concept. Um, so I'll stop here. I think we really need to, to go back to basics and deconstruct the concepts a bit. I would love to hear what you think about that. I wish I was there to, to have a chat afterwards. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you. Really interesting uh, reflections there. Um, so I, I'm going to forgo Chair's privilege of asking the first question so we can open it up uh, to the floor. Uh, so if I need, uh, is there a question online as well or not? Should be one. Yeah, but the Anyone in? Okay, sorry, Alison just got a question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for this. Um, it's a, I find most stimulating. Thank you so much. I have uh, two questions. One relates to um, this uh, case you made for uh, religion being part of how inequalities are molded, so how it affects the inequality at the receiving end, and uh, religion being one of the intersecting inequalities. And I wonder, however, how you uh, how you reckon with the fact that religious beliefs are also those that shape intersecting exclusions. And of course, because we mentioned women's rights on and on, that is the classic case where it is manifested across all religions and uh, how it affects within development the uh, debate around reproductive justice that might include the abortion rights uh, as well as right to families, depending on which uh, uh, societies we're looking at, or indeed issues such as child marriage, which, you know, so how much we mold, you know, the, the, the terrain on which we accept uh, diversity in viewpoints and cosmologies uh, in relation to very sticky points and communities or like parts of communities uh, that might not be assumed uh, to simply accept the religious beliefs at face value uh, as not part of the power relations they experience within that community. That would be one question I have. So how are you dealing with that? Uh, because otherwise we're left with the idea that communities, uh, because uh, they share religious belief or like there is a dominant religious belief, uh, they might be able all to exercise the same type of power vis-a-vis -vis that belief. So that's one question. And the second one I have is in relation to this mobilization, you did it, Andromina, as well, of non-Western cosmologies uh, 
primarily being the issue. Well, I do think, you know, when I think about the colonial interventions, I think the point is that there are specific cosmologies which are excluded, and there are indigenous cosmologies, that, but by the fact that when we talk about development and who enforces development, uh, it's not so much known Western the problem, uh, or like, sorry, Western the problem, is to do with states, is to do to which, who is represented at the level of development organization. And so the major organized religion being represented while instead uh, indigenous right, indigenous cosmologies, uh, generally not being taken into account because uh, either part of settling colonial states and so on and so forth. So um, I was not sure there of how you sort of then account for indigenous uh, issues or issues related to indigenous cosmologies, but that is actually a lack of representation issue mm -hmm. more than, you know, uh, that can be part of uh, the same mm -hmm. way in which we can avoid the problem. Yes, because there are three different questions, and I think they're amazing questions. Thank you so much. Um, so and I think in terms of, because our approach was inductive theorization, we wanted to learn by engaging in different places where people see us as semi-legitimate in some cases, sometimes more depending on who would, would what. Um, we we worked with a plurality of actors in, in, in different communities, um, recognizing that there are inequalities in any community whether we're talking about a Brighton community, whether we're talking at Sint province with uh, a significant Hindu population, or we're talking, it, there will always be intra-group dynamics. And I think it was very important for us not to assume that certain actors will be proxies for the whole community. The idea of, you know, bring me your leader. Well, actually, a leader at what level, to whom? So I think for us, it was very important that at all levels we look at who are the voices that often happen to be excluded while being humble in recognizing no matter how many people we try and involve, we will never be fully represented. But we did make concerted effort to include women of, of socioeconomically marginalized backgrounds. We sought to bring in young people who would not conventionally be brought. So in all the heritage work, we started with the young people, not with the elders. And they were the ones, and uh, women and men, who, had to, who, who were taking forward the agenda. So that's on the... Deve you know, the, the intervention, I hate the word both development intervention, the way of engaging with communities, we're trying to purposely seek out different voices. But on the issue of the tensions of rights, there will always be tensions in different rights. My problem is the double standards that are being applied to actors of faith, because we don't say to someone who is belonging to an LGBTQI community who is targeted, do you, uh, do you have prejudices towards those of a working class? And he or she may. Are you, uh, are you, um, are you fully, uh, do you have racial prejudices? And sometimes they do, like everybody else. In other words, there, there seems to be a double standards where if you're engaging with Christian actors, the assumption is that they are narrow-minded, that they're exclusionary, that they are intolerant. And it seems to me that there are often double standards when engaging with religious actors in the idea of tensions. In other words, the kind of manifesto that people have to sign into, if you come from other minorities, uh, LGBTQI, sexual or, uh, what, or ethnic, even ethnic minorities, fade as if they don't exist, as if Nobody has prejudices, nobody has inequalities that they believe in, except those that are of faith. And I think this is very dangerous, because if we look at indigenous people in Brazil, there are people where there are issues to do with certain practices that severely violate certain rights. But nobody says we will not defend indigenous people's rights to not be persecuted or not to have, we will not, we will stop defending their right to their land because their value system is incongruent with certain aspects of a rights framework. I just think that there is a there is something there to do with um, an emphasis on reconciling those tensions in rights for a particular set of actors, which is not applied to other actors who are also 
targeted and discriminated against on different grounds. So I'm not saying that every single person of faith is inclusive or exclusive. Like other actors, there will be some that have different value systems. But what I'm saying is that we need to be careful that our defense of or our championing of people on the basis of their experiencing unfair inequalities is not conditional upon them uh, tick boxing every single right that we believe they should have. Because we don't do this with indigenous people, we don't do this with LGBTQI, and we should not do it as well with others. Having said that, are there coalitions of faith actors that engage globally that advance agendas that can be exclusive, exclusionary sometimes? Of course. There are all kinds of coalitional actors that advance highly exclusionary actors, and some faith actors are no exception. So there is that level of actors, but then there's also those on the ground who are socioeconomically excluded, racially on the margins, ethnically on the margin, and happen to have a faith identity that makes them additionally vulnerable to and additionally susceptible to forms of inequality that sometimes um, lead to mass atrocities. And unless we recognize that, it would be a problem. I would personally find it a problem to say, I will only defend the Uyghurs that believe in um, X or Y rights. I will defend the Uyghurs because they are targeted and persecuted on the basis of the intersection of their ethnic and religious identity. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that all, everything is resolved. It just means that how, what, how do we engage with those di di divergences in agendas is, is, is one that we have to also be aware of, of, of those aspects. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I've, uh, I'll go to uh, Kate and then we'll, we'll work backwards. And I'll, so I'll come to the person online if you can hear me as well. If people could introduce themselves when they're Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate Maher from the London School of Economics. Um, yeah, thank you for a really thought-provoking presentation. I have two questions, well, a question about par two parallel concepts and two pitfalls I see in what you're doing. You said you were edging towards a more critical angle, so maybe this is an opportunity to, to respond to that. I'm wondering what this perspective adds to two concepts that are already very much in the social sciences and discussion of development, which is identity groups. So I'm Irish. Religion is absolutely central to the way we define our Irish identity groups. So it's it's already very centrally understood among the layers yes. of identity and legal pluralism. So in different societies, you know, people marry in various ways, they um, have uh, various gender ideas about how things should be done. Uh, some people feel they should be allowed to carry a weapon because it's a religious obligation. Societies have been working these things out for quite a long time. Uh, I'm from Canada, the Kirpan issue was a big issue, and then they sat down, talked it over, and now it's not. Um, so what does this add to an understanding of identity groups and legal pluralism as a way of analyzing these issues. Mm -hmm. And then my concerns, I think I see two really risky pitfalls, mm -hmm. the ways in which uh, focusing on religion as though it's a separate uh, angle, a separate kind of identity. On the one hand, the opiate of the masses issue, the way it can be used to mystify material inequalities rather than to address them the way it can also be used to, to legitimize social inequalities rather than address them. Um, and in that process, the entry into beliefs, the melding of identity and belief rather than identity and uh, distinctive legal framings is that it can, it can be used to trump legal rights. Um, so, as an example, in northern Nigeria, a lot of women, Muslim women, don't use Islamic courts. They prefer to go to other kinds of courts because they feel that the rights for them are better there. So, I'm wondering if the issue of the ways in which melding belief systems and identities actually covers over the distinctiveness of identity and 
legal pluralism mm -hmm. and the ability to claim legal rights despite whatever your religious background is. Should we take a few questions at the same time? Do you have a so your hand in there? Hi, I'm Hassan. I'm a postgraduate student at Development Plan University. So uh, my question is related to the practice of development. Because you mentioned that you know the initial of development when there was this assumption that you know religious religion will eventually disappear. But now we see this on the contrary, it's getting stronger and stronger. Uh, but we see in practice like you know there is a uh, uh, still like you know development like NGO all the uh, interventions sort of you know uh, are not like you know. Uh, Collaborating enough with religious institutions. Uh, for instance, like you know, I did my previous dissertation on like um, the role of religious spaces in social development of the communities, and I, I was surprised to see that you know the amount of programs they were happening are like much more uh, comprehensive than any NGO and development intervention. For instance, there was social care, they were offering like you know disability support, and also they were like you know mobilizing resources for other charities uh, within that area. So, so, uh, so my question is that you know we have a existing system in many parts of the world in form of religious spaces, uh, not just at social capital. Why don't you know this international development institutions cooperate and you know utilize those uh, that that capital that spaces uh, to to implement their programs, especially challenging areas you mentioned Afghanistan, for instance. Now it's very difficult for like in in, in New York to operate in Afghanistan, but why don't they complement? Existing efforts of those institutions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Harpen. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read out the online question or put it up on the screen, whatever one is best? So, the, one of them is um, uh, was asked at the back of uh, your answer to Alice's question. I agree with the last point. However, should we not be entitled to formulate a critique of those inegalitarian practices that are also manifested by minority groups? <laughs> And then the first one, like you know, we probably have a first one of it is regarding a massive problem with the concept of community that we all know about. So if there is such a problem, then isn't this mirrored by conceptual inequalities across the board? The very top end of inequality of access is it is not just external public policy institutions which exact diminishing of specific peoples of peoples of faith or color or ethnicity. Often the case, those further inequalities are exacted by faith institutions themselves or their various self appointed representatives. Yes. The Catholic Church, EU, the UK, or Ireland, or elsewhere, that have, doesn't have any kind of track record of equality, which is some law with um, social uh, philosophical teaching. Islamic law, um, as practiced in Iran, or Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, or Pakistan, dozens of countries would like any of the egalitarian. Quranic majority values. The Sikh Council in the UK has recently banned non Sikh or uh, homosexual Sikh from being married in the Sikh, um, the UK Sikh temples. <laughs> Is uh, that this goes on <laughs> and on? Uh, isn't there a much wider answer in yes. equalities of religion? Yes, it's a great question. It goes back to some of the issues raised, which are really important. Right. Um, what does it add to identity grouping? It builds on that work. It's not everything that is done on the idea of recognizing um, religion as an axis of inequality isn't something new. It, in fact, the, work, the purposeful use of inequality is to recognize that we want it to be part of a broader work that has pioneered recognizing different kinds of inequality. I think the point here is to go, is, is neither to say that we move from secular um, reductionism, which is if you don't fit within a secular parameter, you don't fit, to religious essentialism. The move here is not the intention that everything needs to be incorporating faith actors, faith doctrine, faith discourse, which means that you're moving from uh, reductionism to essentialism. Everything has to be, that's not what is being suggested. What is being suggested is that when people are being targeted on the basis of an intersection of different identities together, that the aspect to do with their targeting, which is associated with their faith, has to be recognized as an aspect that, in some contexts, in some points, exposes them to vulnerability. And that is important because when people are being targeted because 
they are socioeconomically poor because they are uh, because in a deeply patriarchal society where women are, are expected to stay in a certain hierarchy within a, in a, a, and so forth. And this all affects your access to resources and your positioning, um, as well as recognizing race, ethnicity, and so forth as an axis of inequality, one has to recognize religion. Because if one doesn't, then one is not only perpetuating the existing inequalities, but is also sometimes inadvertently accentuating them. Happy to give examples if we have time. So here the question isn't advancing the Catholic Church or advancing the Islamic est establishment or necessarily saying we always have to work with faith actors. What we are saying is that when, if we are serious about redressing inequalities in society in general, whether it's with people who have disabilities, whether it's with LGBTQR, whether it's people who are ethnically of not the majority and so forth. Well, that also our inclusive inequalities um, 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 uh, approach needs to also recognize that sometimes people are targeted because of their assumed or real uh, religion or faith. The fact that uh, some people with disabilities may be racist doesn't take away from our need to advance a, 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 a labor law that ensures that they have access and representation. The fact that some LGBTQI are not favoring women's rights does not mean that anyone with, who is of an LGBTQ uh, identity doesn't merit that the inequalities they face are not addressed. I think they're two different things. We're not advancing an ideology, a religious ideology of a doctrine. We're saying, let us recognize this as an axis of inequality, a an axis that is diminished or accentuating depending on pe where people are and, and what they are experiencing. And this has to do with material equalities par excellence. If, let's go back to the Yazidi woman. Because of, in some parts, and again, without generalizing, if you are a Yazidi woman and you have an emergency and you go into some hospitals in some parts of Iraq, it is very likely that one of the doctors will say, I will not treat you. And why will he say that? Not because you're poor, not because you're a woman, but because there are certain stereotypes that Yazidi people don't wash and that they are unclean and that they are X, X and Y. These are all horrible rumors and stereotypes, which means doctors can sometimes say, I will not operate on this one. And I think unless we recognize those kind of ways in which inequalities pertaining to prejudices and discriminations affect access to health, to education. Why is it that people who are not Buddhist are put at the back of the class in Myanmar, whether they are Muslim or Christian? You, you are, you put, you know, it's, it's as if you're being told, hey, you, go back. Don't sit on this road, go back. This is access to material resources that is mediated in part by your religious identity. So absolutely, I completely agree. Let us not divide the realm between the agency and, and the, the social and, and immaterial values from the material rights that have to be secured. Um, um, I can't read my handwriting, but I will make an attempt. <laughs> Um, why not engage with religious institutions? I would actually take it further. I think there are aspects of heritage which far surpass religion, which are have been passed on into generation, which are powerful sources of social solidarity. But because they don't fit a certain box, there isn't a, 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 an attempt to engage with them as repertoires of goodwill in the community. And these are often to do with repertoires of social solidarity. Do they coexist with communities or hierarchies where there are uppers and lowers or where there are class differences, where there are patriarchy? Absolutely, absolutely, they do coexist. But recognizing where they do exist and where they are a source of, of flourishing uh, will certainly enable us to engage in ways that go beyond um, uh, our conventional pathways uh, of engaging. Um, in terms of inegalitarian pr uh, practices by minority groups, couldn't agree with you more. Any, any, you know, there, there are inequalities and those that practice, those that experience oppression does not mean that they will never be 
also uh, exercising uh, forms of oppression or inequalities to others. We know this globally, we know this nationally, we know this locally. But again, it's going back to the fundamental idea. Are you only going to recognize the right to equality for those who fit a certain understanding of the rights that you prioritize as deserving? Do you know, do you remember the idea of the deserving poor and undeserving poor? It's now the deserving people who have experienced inequalities and the undeserving people who are, who are experienced inequalities. Does this mean that you don't critique religious actors who perpetuate inequalities? Of course you critique. That is part of the critiquing of all power dynamics. Um, but then how you critique and your consistency in critiqueness is important because one of the aspects of critiquing uh, uh, international human rights is that they have been inconsistent and they have applied double standards. So let's also bear that in mind in how we engage in our critiques. It is not to stop critiques, but it is to say, let's look at it into the wider, broader um, uh, situation. Um, I can't read the, the last one. <laughs> um, sorry, did, did anybody say so? I think it was pertaining to something here that was in the... So one of the questions was, uh, you know, should we not be entitled to formulate a criteria for building egalitarian practices which are also manifested by minority groups? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, but I just want to say something here because this is really important. The fact let you know, the fact that, let us say, let's go back to the example of Yazidis. The fact that there is domestic violence experienced by the Yazidis doesn't mean let's first deal with domestic violence problem before we then say they have experienced a genocide out of which has come systematic discrimination over decades. Let's first deal with domestic violence and then talk about their genocide. Because that is a very problematic paradigm of assumptions of the hierarchy of what constitutes the key rights first, rather than what people, differently situated people, are saying are their priorities. So I'm not saying, again, it's not a West versus the rest. It is a question of you know, being humble about, of course, the level of representation um, and recognizing their multiple voices in any community, but not negating those voices in what they are prioritizing because those priorities don't fit into our uh, priority lists. I think that's a really uh, excellent place to finish. We've only gone a little bit over time. Uh, it was a really interesting discussion. I've got lots of questions and lots of things I'm going to be going away to reflect on. And I think we've managed to cut through that uh, silence a little bit tonight. Uh, so, you know, please thank both of our speakers, Ramina and, of course, uh, Marie. Thank you.